On my 15th birthday, I'll run away and journey to a far off town and live in a corner of a small library. It sounds like a fairy tale, but it's no fairy tale, believe me, no matter what spin you put on it. (laughs) 2002's Kafka on the Shore remains my favourite Murakami novel. It's also probably the most perplexing. It's a puzzle wrapped up in an enigma and lightly dusted with riddles. The book contains everything from talking cats, fish falling from the sky and Colonel Sanders. Despite this weird and wonderful melting pot, it forms a cohesive story that leaves a lot to interpretation in in the best possible way. While I had made a video explaining Kafka on the shore back in the beginning of 2020, there is still so much left to dive into in this book that I can't sum up in a 15 minute video. So I decided to make an 11 part breakdown series that will go over the book a few chapters at a time and get into the nitty gritty details. Part 1, A Boy Named Crow, will explore the introduction of the two protagonists and the themes they represent. Kafka on the Shore opens on Kafka Tamura, who has stolen 400,000 yen from his father, which back in 2002 was just shy of 3,000 US dollars. But the first person we hear from in the story is not Kafka himself, but the mysterious boy named Crow. What? Crow is a figment of Kafka Tamura's imagination, represented by the fact that he knows things only Kafka would know, like the fact that he stole money from his father. Crow smirks as he looks around. I imagine you've started rifling drawers, am I right? I don't say anything. He knows whose money we're talking about, so there's no need for any long-winded interrogations. He's just giving me a hard time. Towards the end of this three-page prologue, Crow speaks to Kafka from the darkness within, implying that they are the same person, but more on the darkness in a moment. Crow is a representation of Kafka's adult psyche. He is critical of his plans to leave and get a job somewhere as a 15 year old in a town where he knows no one. Crow also uses the metaphor of a violent, symbolic and metaphysical storm to describe what it is like inside Kafka, with the winds changing direction. Yet when Crow puts his hand on Kafka's shoulder, the sandstorm goes away. He insists that Kafka is going to be the world's toughest 15 year old and survive on his own. Crow represents the safety net of being a child, that adult presence in your life who looks after you and takes away the pressure of that sandstorm inside you. Coming of age is about discovering and tackling that storm. It's a scary process and one that never truly ends. Crow references this when he says, And once the storm is over, you won't remember how you made it through, how you managed to survive. You won't even be sure, in fact, whether the storm is really over. But one thing is certain, When you come out of the storm, you won't be the same person who walked in. That's what the storm's all about. Right out the gate, Kafka's story is framed as a coming of age narrative about a young man who feels isolated and discarded and wants to find his place in the world, somewhere he believes he must go alone. But Kafka doesn't do this on a whim, it's a calculated move on his part. Guided by Crow, he decides to prepare his body in the gym and his mind in school, even though to him, academia is a waste of time. His fractured and isolated relationship with his father has convinced him that he will leave and live a solitary life, because he sees himself as this dark monster undeserving of love and affection. Before Kafka leaves the house, he looks into the mirror and reflects on the darkness within him. He imagines it as a dark, omnipresent water pool, which he sees as an evil omen coded into his DNA. This ties to the notion of fate and destiny that the book explores with his father's prophecy that he will kill him and sleep with his mother. While this shares a similarity with Greek mythology, the story deviates drastically from its inspiration. The gods determine Oedipus' fate, and he in his hubris believed he could carve his own destiny, and unwillingly committed the prophesied actions. Kafka seems to take a different route. Kafka is fragile and resentful of himself. From the beginning of the novel, he accepts his darkness within and decides that he must isolate himself from life like the monster he is. When Kafka leaves his father's house, he takes a gold lighter, a flip knife, and a cell phone. He also takes an old photo of he and his sister at the beach, even though he doesn't remember it. There isn't a photo of his mother in the house, his father threw them all away, but this only makes the presence of the single picture of his sister even stranger. It sparks a mystery for the audience, a mystery that isn't necessarily going to be solved because Kafka on the Shore isn't one of those stories that tie everything up in a neat little package. 
But in another nod to Greek culture, Kafka looks into his sister's face, sliced in half by shadow, which Kafka remarks are like Greek tragedy masks. He sees his sister's face as a contradiction of two opposing ideas, just like the masks, hope and despair, happiness and loneliness. Kafka also lists trust and loneliness as one of these dichotomies. Which is interesting because most people think the opposite of trust is deceit. Brilliant characterization on Murakami's part, he's subtly telling us how Kafka views the world, why he is isolated from his father and disconnected from his teachers and peers. His default is to assume the worst in people, which isn't uncommon when we become teenagers and discover that the world isn't necessarily the Disney fairy tale we hoped it would be. But Kafka takes this to the nth degree. He has isolated himself from the entire world because he feels like a monster because of that dark, omnipresent omen inside him. The story then jumps back in time to the end of World War II, to an event known only as the Rice Bowl Hill Incident. A military official named James P. Warden oversees a 12-day investigation of all involved, including a young teacher, Setsuko Okamachi, about a series of events that resulted in her 16 students, 8 boys and 8 girls, after they were mysteriously rendered unconscious. The army has redacted many names and locations from the document. Still, Sensei Okamachi describes how the students were taking outdoor lessons typical for the school. Isolated in their private sanctuary from the war around them, the students learn their lessons and pick mushrooms. The only slight reminder is a single silvery light in the sky, which Okamachi believes is an American aeroplane. Sensei Okamachi notices that three of the children had collapsed. At first glance, she assumes that the children have consumed poisonous mushrooms, but it soon becomes apparent something more sinister has happened as all 16 of the children have collapsed. But something about their symptoms is strange. The children are not genuinely unconscious, their eyes are open and shift from left to right. And when Okamachi lifts them, she notes they feel like rubbery shells. Suppose you've come here for definitive answers on this mystery, in that case, you will be disappointed, and I would recommend that you put the book down now, because this is only the first of many secrets that don't have a clear-cut answer. There are different theories as to what this means, but more on that later. The novel cuts back to Kafka with an interesting parallel. Kafka is on a bus bound for Takamatsu. Aside from the driver, Kafka is the only person awake amongst a crowd of unconscious people. This is a subtle nod to the Rice Bowl Hill incident and a crafty way to connect these seemingly dissonant stories. When they pull over for a pit stop, Kafka strikes up a conversation with Sakura, a young hairdresser. He's instantly attracted to this girl, but tries to remain cool, calm, and collected around her since his voice still cracks from puberty. Sakura and Kafka sit together for the rest of the ride. The girl falls asleep and rests on his shoulder. Kafka has an intense sexual reaction to this girl, which is complicated when he considers that this girl could be his sister. After all, during their conversation, she mentioned she had a brother she hadn't seen in a long time. Every time I discuss this plot point with people, they have an instant reaction of disgust, but I see Kafka's internal struggle as very similar to Jon Snow from Game of Thrones, who remained a virgin for fear he might sleep with his mother. Kafka's fear is a result of an uncertain past. He has only a photo of his sister and no recollection of his mother. Naturally, this forces him to assess the women in his life as a potential sister or mother. It highlights how the protagonist yearns for a typical family, despite the fact he can never have one. We then cut back again to the investigation on the Rice Bowl Hill incident. This time, the interview is with the local doctor, Junichi Nakazawa. He recalls how Sensei Okamachi ran into town to find help and how he organized the townspeople to retrieve the children. In his professional opinion, he discounts many different possibilities that might answer what happened. The assistant principal's theory was that the Americans had dropped a gas bomb on them, which falls apart when you consider that Sensei Okamachi was left unharmed. Still, in the end, he couldn't give a comprehensive conclusion as to what happened. He also goes on to discuss what happened to the children afterwards. Most of them regained consciousness, but had no memory of what happened. Only one child didn't wake up, Setoru Nakata. The doctor notes that the military took the child away and that they never heard from him again. Though we cannot give one definitive answer to what happened at the Rice Bowl Hill, it is apparent that it has a supernatural element. Considering the references to spirituality later in the novel, the silver light refers to the book's ending, which we will discuss in the final episode of this series. And if you're feeling lost at this point, 
you're not alone, and hopefully it will all make sense in the end. But if you wanted a more general analysis of the novel, I have an old video I made discussing the entire book in more general terms. In the next episode, we'll look at what Kafka does when he reaches Takamatsu, the introduction of Oshima and Miss Seiki, and what happened to the mysterious boy Nakata. All of that and a lot more in the next episode. He can talk to cats. Also subscribe and hit the bell icon to find out when the next episodes are available. I also have a new video coming soon to give my first impressions on Haruki Murakami's latest novel, First Person Singular. Also, I'm running my deep dive series into The Knife of Never Letting Go and the life and fiction of HP Lovecraft. If that sounds good to you, please consider subscribing to stay updated on the latest videos and I will see you guys in the comments section.